first of all, th thank you very much. Uh, that was fun. That was uh, pretty awesome as well at the same time. So, um, and, and really interesting. And um, we now have a couple minutes for Q and A. And uh, like everything else tonight, the Q and A will be in hybrid format. And um, so questions can be asked either by members of the audience here um, on site, or in fact um, by people who are watching this virtually through the uh, Slido app. And um, my colleague Alessandro here. Uh, is, is going to censor all the questions and uh, only pick the most interesting ones and uh, uh, and um, and ask them. So, um, which way should we start? Uh, do we, do we, first of all, do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, in that case, uh, oh yeah, actually there is. Uh, I can't quite see against the bright lights who, who that is, but. Uh, Hi, uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Uh, my question is about the pictures that you showed. Uh, more specifically, do you actually use them to gain research intuition, or are they just there to add some color afterwards? Sorry, do I use them to to, to actually intuition? gain intuition for for um, the actual research work, uh, or is it just yeah, afterwards? Yeah, actually, partly yes. Um, I guess not specifically for this particular piece of uh, work, but um, in general, yes. So there, there certainly have been bits of work that started from a numerical simulation. Yeah. You would basically, yeah, you would simulate something and say, oh, yeah, you know, this behavior sort of looks interesting. Can you actually prove that? Or can you figure out why it behaves in a certain way? Um, yeah, so absolutely, yeah. Thanks. And, and actually, on, on that, in the numerical simulation, how do you deal with the um, divergence of the derivatives? Do you just kind of discretize things and then... Uh, and yeah, then so here it's just yeah. brutally, if you want. Well, okay, so in this particular case, there is a... Um, well, so one thing you could do, which is not quite what is done here, but what you could do is you just brutally discretize things. Um, and then, of course, you you would get something which is very big on the right-hand side, but that just means that the whole thing kind of moves up very fast, and then you just sort of move your reference frame up with it, right? And so you kind of recenter it. So. Okay, uh, Alessandro, I know you've got a list of questions. Uh, someone is actually asking through the app, if it is mathematically understood why some theories, like quantum gravity, are non-renormalizable. Uh, so I'm not at all an expert on quantum gravity, so I'm afraid that I'm not at all the right person to ask uh, that specific question. Uh, so we have another one that is, uh, in what sense the solution of the KPZ equation kind of like Brown and Mush? Oh, um, so in the sense that if you, if you take the equation on the whole line and you start as initial condition with a Brownian motion, then at later times it will still be a Brownian motion, right? And, but, you know, which is correlated to the previous one in a complicated way but it will still be a Brownian motion in space. Um, and if you start with any initial condition, and you, know, you look at the solution at time one, say, then over a finite interval, the law of the solution is going to be, uh, well, okay, so uh, can you actually prove? Yes, you can prove that. Yes, the law of the solution will be actually equivalent to a, you know, the law of a Brownian motion. So in that sense, like all the almost sure properties are the same. So what then actually happens um, in the, for the KPZ equation in, in higher dimensions, so in like two plus oh, one dimensions? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, it's, so in some sense for the KPZ equation, the two dimension is sort of critical and it's very poorly understood. So even at the um, sort of physical level, if you want. Uh, it's poorly understood. So I think uh, the belief is that in higher dimension, there should be kind of a phase transition. So if you take a microscopic model of surface growth in two dimensions, um, the belief would be that there is a, what they would call sort of a strong coupling phase and a weak coupling phase. And in the strong coupling phase, there would be a scaling limit for which people don't know the correct exponents by which to rescale things, and they have absolutely no clue how to describe that scaling limit. Um, so not even physicists know uh, much about that, except for like you know results of experiments, numerical experiments. Um, and in the weak coupling phase, 
I believe that you would somehow, um, well, okay, no, maybe I don't want to talk any nonsense, okay, I'm not completely sure what would be the correct conjecture, but in the weak coupling phase, it should essentially be described as of something Gaussian. Um, uh, I actually have a question uh, that answers my curiosity. Uh, the question is, your early career has been oscillating between mathematics and physics, and probably your work is really on the interface between the two, having so many applications uh, and analogies with physical problems. Uh, how do you see the interaction between those two fields, and also what drove your personal trajectory more towards mathematics? Um, yeah, so, okay, so personally, I actually studied physics uh, as an undergrad, and, well, Officially, my PhD was in the physics department as well, but I guess in pretty much any other country except for Switzerland, uh, it would have been in the math department. So somehow Switzerland has a tradition of having kind of mathematical physics in the physics department. In most other countries, it would be in the math department. Um, so I guess I, I kind of moved more and more towards sort of more pure mathematics. Um, Currently, I mean, I would consider myself really as a mathematician and not as a physicist, but I, I like mathematical problems that have some link to physics or some link to, you know, some kind of description of reality. Um, but that's mainly a matter of taste. So in some sense, what I like these type of problems because I also, you know, I have it's easier for me to build an intuition also for the behavior of these kind of problems. Uh, but I would really consider myself as a pure mathematician in a way. I mean, you know, what interests me is to, you know, prove the actual theorems that really, you know, prove that these things behave in a certain way and so on. Have we got any more questions from the audience, either in the house or on the web, oh, yes, the Tom, yes. Um, can you say a bit more about the, the sort of Wilsonian space of physical theories? Um, Sorry. So I'll start again with the microphone. Um, can you say a bit about the um, uh, Wilson's theory of um, physical theories being represented by different points in, in some particular high dimensional topological space? Or? It's it's really something to sort of aid the intuition. Um, it's very difficult to make that precise mathematically, right? So, so it's a picture that people use to guide their intuition. It's typically not something that they use to actually turn it into mathematics. So there are very few people who manage to, you know, write mathematical theorems that really actually, you know, think of where you sort of mathematically describe your space of models as, you know, as you say, some kind of topological space with zooming out being a dynamical system on that space. Um, there are sort of, there are special cases in which that really works, works well if you want as a mathematical setup. Um, but in most cases, including this one, it's really more about guiding your intuition than about setting up a mathematical framework, if that makes sense. Someone from the app is asking if you can expand a little bit on the discretization-based derivation of the TV divided by two factor in the Brownian motion. Sorry, on the? On the um, derivation of the T halves uh, factor oh, okay. in the Brownian motion. Very interesting for us as an audience. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, right, so, so what you see here, right, so here that was the other example, right? So if you, so in the, in the asset price model, um, the natural discretization was that somehow the change in your asset price is essentially like a little increment of your Brownian motion times the value of the asset itself at the time sort of before the increment, if you want, right? Um, and that's natural because you can't predict the future. Well, maybe you guys can. Uh, <laughs> but you're not supposed to be able to. <laughs> um, 
Now, for example, if you just think of this as a differential equation, then, for example, this would be also a perfectly decent discretization, right? Where you would say, oh, the uh, increment of your asset price is equal to the corresponding increment of your brand emotion times not the value of the asset price at the beginning of the increment, but sort of the average of the value between the value at the beginning and the value at the end. Okay, sort of, you know, if these things were smooth, then that would just be a slightly different numerical scheme, if you want, for uh, approximating that differential equation. Um, well, then here that one then converges to, if you want, the Stratonovic solution to that differential equation, which is the one that just obeys the normal rules of calculus. And in general, so you know, if you want, you have this one parameter family of solution theories where, so if, you, if you've done some stochastic calculus, then you've probably learned about somehow Ito equations versus Stratonovic equations. Um, but there's really, I mean, these are the two that are sort of special because both of them have nice properties, right? Stratonovic is the only one that somehow obeys the rules of calculus. Ito is the only one that has Ito isometry and Martingale property and so on. But there's really a whole one parameter family, right? Where, say, if I put the zero at Ito, then Stratonovic would be at a half, but then there would be some sort of an Ito going backwards in time at one. Um, and, you know, there's a whole one parameter family, right? And that one parameter family, it's sort of similar to the fact that in the previous toy model, right, the one with the sort of one over x distribution, uh, you are forced to look at a one-parameter family because you cannot put an origin for the parameter that tells you how many multiples of the delta function you sort of subtract, right? And so here it's a little bit similar in the sense that you have this additional, like, Ito Stratonovich correction type term, which in this particular case just corresponds to this constant times t, which comes with a constant in front, and there's this one-parameter family of somehow solution theories and if you really want to understand the thing, you have to understand somehow the whole, the fact that there is this one parameter family. Right. Thank the, you very the much. Difference, the, the difference here is that there are somehow two distinguished points on that one parameter family, which is Ito and Stratovich. I have another question uh, from the app. Uh, is there any general criterion that can be used to determine whether a theory that contains infinities is renormalizable or not? Um, yeah, so there is some, so for example, so in this particular case with these stochastic PDEs, um, there is a power counting criteria. So there's some kind of subcriticality type criteria, which essentially tells you that um, in terms of the behavior on the rescaling, the nonlinear bits in the equation should in some formal sense, be weaker than the linear part when you look down at very small scales. Right? Uh, and there is, you know, you can make that precise, you know, you can write down some sort of power counting criterion for that. Um, and of course, so from the physical point of view, of course, the, the interesting, the most interesting field theories are what they would call the conformal field theories, and that's the ones where you're actually at the point where the nonlinear part has precisely the same strength somehow as the linear part, um, that, that's much more difficult to somehow deal with. I also have in the app a more personal question, which is, when you're working on those problems, where do you tend to get your breakthrough ideas? At your desk, in the office, or somewhere else, working? <laughs> <laughs> so, Anywhere is fine for me. So. <laughs> no, I mean, it doesn't, you can't, you can't sort of conjure an idea, like it sort of, if an idea comes, it comes. Um, and it doesn't, yeah, it's not necessarily somehow when you're sitting at your desk or something. I mean, it, it might be because you're thinking about something just before falling asleep, or it might be that you're, you know, walking somewhere or whatever. I mean, there are, I mean, you do spend, you know, so it sort of depends. So you do spend some time, of course, you know, like scribbling on a piece of paper and doing sort of calculations. Um, and sometimes calculations do lead to sort of conceptual insights. 
Um, but sometimes also you don't necessarily need somehow, you know, the piece of paper in the calculation and then you could have an idea anywhere. Be under the shower or something. We, we probably have time for, for one more question. Alessandro, do you have more? Yes. Or, uh, <laughs> excellent. I have actually one uh, from a skeptical person about what we do in GR, which is does the scale invariant property of the time series, financial time series, mean that actually the effort of trying to predict them is futile in a way? Well, this wasn't okay. Maybe you should. <laughs> so, but, but this wasn't meant to be realistic model, right? I mean, this is like the most naive model you can possibly imagine. If you sort of, you know, this would be like an idealized model where you just have somehow random trades without any kind of additional information, without any sort of external event happening or anything like that. Right? No. Yeah, I think it's fair to say it's not, not entirely random. There's, there's possibly always a little bit of drift. Cool. But um, I, I think we're probably uh, going to bring this to, to a close now. Um, and so I, so I suggest we, we thank uh, 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 the speaker again for a really quite wonderful lecture. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. It was really illuminating. Thanks very much.